Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Jacobson. I work here at the Palo Alto Research Center, and uh, I'm very delighted to welcome you to this special forum, which is the 12th talk in our special speaker series on going beyond web 2.0. It's all about power of the web for connecting people, collaborati collaboratively co-creating knowledge, enabling organizations to effectively use social computing tools, and a lot more. We have had 11 t before, 11 talks about this, plus many other forum talks, so please do look at our Park Forum website video archive at park.com. You can find the link to that and, and see all the other activities that have happened both under the Beyond Web 2.0 umbrella as well as the other topics. You could sign up for, for notices for future forum events too. And speaking of future forum events, uh, please uh, make a note in your calendar for next Thursday. We will be featuring the editor-in-chief of Wired Magazine, Chris Anderson. He's the author of The Long Tail, that's T-A-I-L. He'll be giving a uh, talk in our series. It's called Free, Why Zero Dollars and Zero Cents is the Future of Business. But what's exciting is what's happening here now today. I'm delighted to introduce our forum speaker, Lisa Petridis. Lisa Petridis is the president and founder of the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management in Education, which sh she envisioned and formed and has really created an impact in the area of education and knowledge management. Her organization, ISCME, is an independent nonprofit educational research institute that's located in Half Moon Bay, out by the ocean. ISC ISCME's work includes applied research, innovative projects, and field building initiatives in the area of knowledge sharing and education. Lisa has led the OER Commons, and she'll talk to you about that because it's very much Web 2.0. She's led the OER Commons Initiative, which is an open source teaching and learning network that focuses on supporting teachers and learners to facilitate the creation and ad ad adaptation of dynamic and evolving open educational resources. Lisa used to be a professor in the Department of Organization and Leadership at Columbia University Teachers College back in New York. Uh, but she's a Bay Area girl born and bred and received her PhD in education from Stanford as well as her MBA from Sonoma State. Uh, Lisa is also, uh, she's a multi-talented artist, visionary, and a mensch. That means she's a sweetheart. Uh, she's a painter and a sheet metal artist who exhibits her work throughout the Bay Area. I've known Lisa for about 25 years uh, from the world of uh, music uh, recording, which is another really truly collaborative process that's been highly influenced by the web. And now Lisa's taking her visionary skills and her talents and seeing what the web's going to do to education. Please help me welcome Lisa Petridis. Lisa? Well, good afternoon. Uh, I think I don't need this mic, right? I can just sort of put it down here. So, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here and to tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing with ISCME, the work around OER Commons, but more generally, just sort of maybe, if I can, kind of infect you with some enthusiasm about what the whole open source field can really offer <coughs> to education in terms of open content and open resources. So that's kind of my goal for the next hour or so. Um, I just want to say also um, there are several people in the room who are also been mavericks and pioneers in this area. Um, maybe towards the end I'll single them out. I won't do it now. I'll give them some warning. Um, but we, we also have a wealth of uh, information uh, of, of among other people in this room. And you know who you are, Judy and Timu and people like that. So I want to just tell you a little bit more about ISCME. Thank you, Linda, for, um, for that introduction uh, and telling you a little about the work of ISCME. But I want to tell you the work about ISCME in relation to our whole open education resource area. So the work that we've been doing for a number of years, both as ISCME and I've been doing for over 15 years more generally, is really looking at this whole way of how we use information and knowledge for continuous learning, how we build capacity to do that, how we apply it to well-defined problems. And ultimately, what we're really talking about is how we create human-centered, knowledge-driven environments. And those are a lot of words, but how do we really create human-centered and knowledge-driven environments that really focus ultimately on learning and success? 
So the way that we do this work within ISKME, we do social science research, we do some evaluation that's really related to this work. Um, we do our own um, developing and sharing of innovations. And we, we have projects, which OER Commons is one of them, that is really facilitating knowledge sharing and field building in the field of education. There's kind of a conceptual theoretical model that we've written a lot about. I'm not gonna say too much about it now, but I'll just tell you the acronym, you'll remember it maybe, called DICA, which is simply the whole data information knowledge action continuum. So I know people here at Park for a long time have been thinking about this whole area of when data becomes information, when information becomes knowledge. And then really what we think of in terms of our work is then how we really put that into practice within the education sector. And not only put it into practice, but then what do we learn from it once it's there? How do we build feedback loops that help us continue to improve in an ongoing way? So it's very much of a systems approach to thinking about these issues. So enter OER, which is Open Education Resources. And so what I wanna say, and this is why I wanted to frame it in this DICA way, is that OER is ultimately, it's really a process of knowledge sharing, creation, and continuous learning. I've just for just a show of hands quickly, how many people are within the education field in some way already? So colleges, anybody from K-12 here? Great, okay, good. So I'm just kind of curious, and, and are the rest of you more maybe in the data or information sharing knowledge world? Okay, great, excellent. All right, um, so I just wanna sort of tell you what, you know, at least as we see, you know, what are the inputs here into this work that we're doing? Uh, what has happened in the last few years or in the last five or more years around, you know, Web 2.0 and all of the infrastructure that that requires? I mean, when I say infrastructure, I don't mean just the technology infrastructure. I really mean the cultural, you know, the social, the cultural, all those pieces that really impact the work. So alternative licensing has certainly been a big part of what has propelled this movement forward, just with like the open source movement. Um, has everybody, has anybody here not heard of Creative Commons? Okay, so just briefly, since most of you have, Creative Commons is actually an organization that has created a lot of alternative licenses that basically say you can share and reuse things in a way that's not an all not an all rights reserved. It takes the all rights reserved concept, d you know debundles it and lets people assign certain rights to the kinds of things they want to share. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's it in essence. So alternative licensing. Um, platforms that allow people to reauthor and remix, and that's all been about Web 2.0. It's been about wikis and blogging and, and the myriad of technologies that we have now that allow us to um, actually, as more basic users, actually do something online, create something, post something in a way that we couldn't before. That seems so pedestrian now because everybody does it, right? Even my mother posted on a blog, I think. I was rather stunned. but. Um, the, the last piece really are the tools that facilitate this continuous feedback loop and invite participation into it. And those are somewhat about the platforms, but I think the tools are also very specifically about things that allow us to co-create and sort of engage with each other, um, whether that is uh, a process flow by which something's happening or simply the way that we share tags. Um, and I don't just mean the fact that we tag it, but then how we build networks around tagging and things like that. So those are really the inputs into what's happening. And I think what we've seen is that we're really creating new knowledge, new scholarship um, through this input of people within education, often very diverse populations, whether they're um, you know, K-12, higher ed, informal learners, homeschoolers. I should also say that this work is not just US-based. In fact, I would say some of the most exciting uh, work is happening internationally. There's a lot of work happening in Europe with um, European Schoolnet. Uh, there's also a lot of work happening in Africa and Southeast Asia. So this is a movement that is really gaining um, visibility and participation worldwide, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So this whole idea, again, it's really about, you know, how do we expand on this whole knowledge creation idea by incorporating user-gathered data and information. So we're sort of back to that data information knowledge. 
It's really also about providing an opportunity to test ideas, to learn by doing, modeling good practices of inquiry. Again, I'm speaking a little abstract now, but I'm gonna give you lots of examples in a minute. And ultimately, it's really about adding value to resources. To, when we say education resources, that's a pr that can be a pretty big definition. You know, for those of you who have been teachers or professors, you know, you might uh, education resources certainly a lesson plan, it's a lecture, it's notes, it's a map, it's a graphic, it's pedagogy, it's many things, right? So when we say open education resources, we're really talking about that whole myriad of things that it could be. It's not just one thing. And that ultimately we're adding value to those resources by the whole reuse, the adaptation, and the collaboration. So just an example, what am I talking about? Um, you know, adding to this knowledge base. How many of you have heard what the Library of Congress did res recently with Flickr? So this to me was one of the most brilliant maneuvers I've seen at least in the last month and a half or so. Here in Silicon Valley, we see a lot of them, don't we? It's easy to get bored. Oh, another brilliant maneuver. But this one really did grab me for a lot of reasons, part of, partly because this is the work that we're trying to understand and, and grapple with. So the Library of Congress, which has hundreds of thousands of resources, took a set of them, which I believe was about 50,000, and actually put them on Flickr, made them accessible through Flickr, and allowed Flickr users to tag the pictures. Uh, so what we're seeing now is a whole body of work that we might argue was barely findable, right? Because findable is certainly the, the first piece of what we need to do around encouraging people to use open education. But not only that, they're creating tags and, and keywords and comments around these resources that we never even would have if the Library of Congress hadn't taken these things and made them available. Now what's interesting is that the Library of Congress doesn't have a formal license on these pictures, but they do share them under this no known restrictions. So um, and this, uh, we could have a whole other conversation just about copyright, which is probably another topic for a forum, but um, just enough here to say that they've made these available, anybody can use them and anybody can tag them. So really it's prompting new knowledge about resources that others can benefit from. Um, so the concept of facilitating scholarship is really important. We have PLOS, that's the Public Library of Science. They have the free and open scholarly journals across several different disciplines. Now their content platform, it allows users not only to share and download them, but they can comment on them, they can respond to the article. And again, I would consider this part of the open education resource um, you know, community. Certainly PLOS has been around for a long time. But when we think of how we really expand those definitions, we, we would uh, want to include open journals. And I would say that they have certainly been also um, a maverick in this work as well in education. Um, so I'm giving you some examples of how we're seeing some of these things work today. Uh, incorporating geodata, uh, that's physical addresses, maps, directions, things like that, into teaching and learning. So how does that happen? Well, for example, KQED, our local um, public television here, they um, are making available all of their videos and they are now actually attaching geodata to it, which means if you're a teacher and you're studying marine biology, you could look up, you, know, you could use the, the geotag data to find you know, dolphins in Monterey Bay and be able to incorporate that into your classroom material. So it's, and that's just one example, but when you start thinking about how people could be collaborating in a, in a way that where specifically, you know, geography is, is integral to the learning process of that. We've kind of expanded the dimensions of how we think about, and you can't do that if you just have a textbook that you're flipping through, you know, linear pages, right? All of a sudden we have a multi-dimensional resource that's almost organic in a way. So what does that do? Well, what we find is that, you know, these are resources that end up supporting maybe local needs, they interface with the community, this whole preservation of place, all the things that are really important when we think about certainly in an international context uh, of how and why we might engage around materials. By the way, I use marine biology, but it could just as easily be something about culture or, you know, the social interaction in a geographic way. Um, I talked a little bit about licensing. This is a, just a screenshot of Learn NC. It's a North Carolina group that's done a lot of work around K-12 resources. Um, they have 
um, reauthoring platforms that allow users to repost their modified content back to the community. Um, you can see in the bottom right hand side uh, to share and to remix um, our uh, th these items are available for sharing or remixing and they delineate that so you can see the difference. And I guess what I want to just make one comment about that for those of you who might not be as familiar with um, alternative licensing, sharing one thing, sharing is one thing, right? The, the fact that you can copy something and distribute it, use it for your classroom without, uh, or just for yourself or your personal learning, that's the kind of a first level of sharing. To be able to take that and adapt that, to remix it, to translate it, right? Those are the next pieces. So for example, I had to sign a form when I came in today that said that, you know, A, it, can, it, you know, can, it, can this be broadcast anywhere? Absolutely. Um, can it be used and distributed? Absolutely. On the form, it didn't say, can this be remixed? But if Park did use Creative Commons license like that, I would say absolutely. That would mean that somebody could take both the PowerPoint presentation, they could take snippets of this talk today, they could take that and they could remix it and use some piece of it. They could take something I've said and take something that contradicts what I've said and put those together and develop some curriculum around it, right? So that's what we really mean by remix and it's a really important concept. And if you ask any 20 year old this, they'll really understand what you mean because they're doing it <coughs> just wildly with music and videos and games and things like that. So let me tell you about OER Commons specifically because this is something that ISCME has been working with for the last uh, few years and it's oercommons.org, and this is just a screenshot of the front page. And basically, we've done a few things. For starters, we've aggregated and curated um, about 20,000 resources from all over the world. And that number, by the way, is rapidly increasing. Probably at this time, six months from now, it'll be at 100 or 150,000 resources. And what we do is we curate the metadata around these resources, and I'm not sure um, from a technical perspective, how many people here are really uh, into the whole metadata world. But it's a fascinating area, particularly in, in education, because what metadata allows us to do is to help people find things, search them, and then reuse them in a way. And metadata is everything from subject level. It's, you know, it's the description, you know, on your Starbucks coffee on the side, it says, you know, syrup, number of pumps, is what kind of milk was it, right? All of those things, that's metadata about your coffee, right? So we're really talking about the same thing. We're just saying that, you know, metadata might be subject le uh, grade level, uh, is how is this item licensed? Uh, is there pedagogical materials that accompany it so I could know how to use it? That, that's all what we mean by metadata. So we've been collecting this metadata, we've been allowing users to um, tag it, to um, add their own um, reviews, ratings of the material. But perhaps a more important piece of, that was sort of the proof of concept to say, you know what, there is so much amazing content out there that people are already creating. How do we find it? And then what is our motivation and incentive to use it? So a big piece of what we've been doing is really trying to facilitate these collaborative projects with groups of teachers. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of those projects that we've been working on because it's one thing to have it there, it's another thing to actually have people roll up their sleeves and start using it and face the type of problems that they might. So here's an example of some user-generated metadata. Uh, how did you use this material? Well, this is from a, an item about, this is really interesting. This is an item about avian flu. Um, well, actually this was a course that somebody was developing on avian flu. Uh, it says, how did you use this material? I'm planning to introduce avian flu and wanted to revisit the 1918 pandemic. So what they did is these were biologists. They were biology teachers. And so they came to the site looking for biology materials because they're teaching about the avian flu. When they got to our site and typed in flu and did a search, they found all these really cool oral histories about the flu pandemic in the, 19, in the early 1900s. So now these biology teachers got to use some interdisciplinary materials of actual people's experience around the pandemic. So what an interesting way to, you know, all of a sudden bring together interdisciplinary resources in a way that they might not had imagined before. But anyway, these are the, the examples of the kind of user-generated metadata. Did you augment it? In which courses did you use the material? How would you recommend using it? So again, it's how do we start to create a body of knowledge around resources? 
One other really important thing I want to say too is that, and this is more for you, um, how many people here were self-described uh, as geek? Okay, just wanted to check. So here's the concept. The concept is how do we then take this metadata and put it back out to the world in an, in an interoperable way that in fact means that whenever this, this resource is in the world, this metadata can follow ar it around. The idea isn't that everybody has to come to OER Commons to find out how somebody used this material and, and, you know, and how they recommended its use, but how do we really do that? And that's a big piece of what we're doing now internally from a technical um, standpoint. So if any of you have ideas about that, you should talk to me after, because it's a big part of our initiatives today. And I think, frankly, it is really the way of, you know, it's the web 3.0 that we are about to um, embrace. Um, also, and this isn't too innovative, but maybe it is for the education space. Uh, this is just an example of a, sh a shared workspace. Uh, it's MediaWiki. It's the wiki that drives uh, Wikipedia. And within it, um, teachers are now starting to actually, we have some specific projects where they're um, developing uh, open education resources with their classrooms and posting them and working them here. So this is just an example of what it looked like. Um, one of, the, one of the projects I want to take a moment and tell you about, this is a pilot project. It's with 18 middle school science teachers across four continents. And they're working together with their students to find resources, to post documents, share teaching strategies, all about climate change studies and, and data collection on climate change. So they're actually doing some temperature readings and uh, water sampling and things like that. And this whole idea of a collaboratory, you know, these global collaboratories, is what I think this whole open education really supports. Because, and people say questions, well, what are they gonna do? Are, are they gonna translate the materials? Or how are they gonna talk? Right? Let's find out, right? We don't know until we actually have, uh, have sort of the technology and the processes in place that teachers and classrooms can actually use before we see how they're gonna work. What we've seen so far is it's really exciting. Um, obviously, this group of 18 teachers was a, was a group that came forward and wanted to work on this project, so they were highly motivated. Um, but what's, we're, what we're really seeing, it's at the intersection here, because we have these communities of educators, students, and scientists, this whole idea about contemporary science and what does investigation and discovery mean. And again, when we think about my earlier slides, when we think about continuous learning and inquiry and improvement, this is really gets to the heart of what we're talking about in terms of collaborative processes. Um, and then it's, of course, great that we have a lot of e-science resources online now. So we have online data sets, there's tools, there's simulations. There's a lot of great organizations that are doing work around that in terms of making these things available. And then we have what we would call the open education resources, lesson plans, assignments, assessments, simulations, all those kinds of things that um, that we actually point to as well within OER Commons. We're also involved, and I'm just gonna tell you briefly some of the things on this slide. We have ongoing research projects about OER um, development efforts worldwide. Um, just, I wanted to give you a sense of what's happening and what some of the issues are that people are uh, addressing. So free high school science text, this is a South African initiative where uh, a bunch of high, I'm sorry, college grad students, physics and chemistry and biology students were doing some um, traveling throughout South Africa doing the equivalent of our science fairs and realizing that a lot of these kids that they were talking to didn't even have science textbooks. So they took it upon themselves. They said they basically decided to go back home and spend a couple months and write some textbooks and make them open. These were all definitely geeks who were well into the open source you know, area. Well, five years later, <laughs> they, um, they did all eventually finish their dissertations, but they um, got funding from the Shuttleworth Foundation, which is a big foundation in South Africa, and they actually created these books with about 300 volunteers and are now talking with the Ministry of Education to see about making open education a, a countrywide initiative. So this is, I think, a really interesting piece that we're seeing around o OER initiatives worldwide. Some of them are very top-down mandated, and this one, like I just described, the Free High School Science, is very much a grassroots effort. And I think what's probably most interesting is how these two worlds are sort of coming together and what do we have in the middle. So in that example, we have a very grassroots effort of these science graduate students 
and now we have the Ministry of Education and they've sort of met in the middle. And I think those are the kinds of things in this country we're not really seeing yet, but I think we're seeing the, um, we're seeing both of those pieces, but not really intersecting yet. Um, Curriki is a wiki-based platform that um, people are experimenting with, just getting, trying to get teachers to create lesson plans and things like that. So we're doing some research with them to see what is it that really motivates teachers specifically to get engaged and motivated. Uh, Telecenters.org, it's, um, this is actually a group in India which has tried to have some peer production models around creating content. So we're looking at what some, how some of those models have worked for them, what's been more effective and what hasn't. WGBH is really interesting. That's the public broadcasting group in Boston. And their task was they had about 10 years of legacy content that they wanted to try to make available through alternative licensing, specifically Creative Commons licenses. So they have spent the last three or four years actually working with this old content. And what does that mean, legacy content, and trying to make it openly available? Well, they had a, you know, a music, it had a song, a soundtrack in it that's copyright. So they had to take that out or try to get permission or put in something that was uh, under Creative Commons licenses. So they're doing a lot of work about this whole legacy content. And it's a really interesting issue to study because some people are saying, let's just start from scratch. Let's just create all this material. We, you know, we know what the issues are. We know what good curriculum is. Let's just make it. And other people are saying, we have spent years. We have spent hundreds of millions of dollars. If you think of any of every NSF grant that's been written, that's been a collaboration with a university professor that's created curriculum for K-12 schools. I mean, how many people here have been involved in some of those efforts? And where are they? The best ones are maybe still active. The best one also may be on a server or on a computer that's in that person's office who no longer works there, right? So these are just, it's bringing up these really interesting issues of, you know, where is the world's knowledge and how do we want to, you know, make it available to everybody. So just quickly, some of the barriers to learning. I mean, I think without going into a whole sort of treatise about educa our education system and what's wrong and right with it, I mean, I think we really have to think hard about how we reinforce these structures that support collaborative ways of working. I think teachers inherently, they still are trained to work collaboratively. And if anybody's been a teacher, you know, after four or five, six, seven, or, you know, a decade uh, in the classroom, you know, you're doing your thing. You might not be collaborating in that way. You're just trying to, you know, get by. Um, there's more pressures. There's more time demands put on you. Um, how do we reverse that? How do we really kind of reinforce those structures and what does that look like? And what is the reward for teachers to actually take time to do this now? I would argue that in fact our teacher training institutions are probably one of the first places we need to work. I think this third point is sort of the mo uh, one of the most important points in terms of more of the formal education structures. And I, I can speak with some knowledge in this country, but when I g travel internationally, I hear this over and over again from other teachers as well that this whole idea of reclaiming the, you know, the professionalism of teaching, you know, because so often now teachers are thought of these delivery mechanisms, right? And I always think, you know, you deliver a pizza, right? You don't deliver curriculum, right? Curriculum is about teaching and engaging and understanding the learner and developing ways to reach students, right? It's not about just having something ready-made that you can deliver. So this whole open education idea has actually been received more favorable from teacher unions and organizations like that that you might think would say, ah, oh, not one more task to do. But in fact, they're saying, yes, this is in fact the work of teachers. So this is a really exciting piece. And ultimately, uh, the last point here is, you know, are teachers going to just willingly step back into that role? Are they going to become the author, the remixer, you know, the online collaborator? Again, I think some of our early examples show that in a very supportive way they will be, but what does that mean on a mass scale? And you know, how could we reach a tipping point in that way with teachers? Just quickly also, here's just a survey that we had put up on the front page of OER Commons a while back that said, um, that asked people why they were in fact accessing these materials. So you can see that the greatest percentage said they wanted to expand knowledge, stay current or get ideas, that was 60%. And then uh, we have 17% were saying they want to supplement lessons, 15% said they wanted to improve teaching methods, 11% was to connect with other teachers and learners. 
So we're also starting to get a sense of why people might go out and look for these kinds of materials in the first place and then how they might use them. I want to take a moment, uh, and actually take a little bit and pause for some questions and then kind of tell you, just kind of give you a little bit of summary about some of our work. Yes. Sure. I want to touch on the big green part. Does that suggest to you that teachers are really thirsting for this self-directed um, expansion? When we talk about trying to stay current, yes. trying to develop ourselves, and when you look at why are we doing OER, it's not to develop a new lesson or to teach something else, it's to try to catch up. Absolutely. I mean, again, I'm, I'm a you know, self-professed education evangelist, so I, that's my bias, right? But so I'm going to say to you that, you know, people say teachers don't have time, right? This is what I hear a lot. There's no time to do this work. But all of our evidence so far is showing that, in fact, there is a thirst. Teachers do go home at night and browse the web and try to find things to both inspire them and to inspire their students. They've been teaching some lesson. They know that there's another piece to add. They're not sure what. If they sit there and they look and they search and 45 minutes later they found something, they're really excited. That is often what teachers are doing at night. And if somebody can tell me if, they, if they've seen that's not the case, but that is really what all of our you know, studies have shown so far. So I would say emphatically. And again, I think, and I'm glad you raised that question because I think a huge part of this is how do we tap into the processes that are already happening within education and really leverage those and support those things from happening? It's, you know, we know change doesn't happen because you come in and say, everybody here is gonna do it all differently now, right? That's not how change happens. Change happens because we find out what people are doing, how they're doing it, what can, you know, how do they wanna do more of that? You know, what are those processes? What are those pockets of energy that already exist that people could take to the next level? In the back there, yes. So the question is about policy and how important is that in, in making the incentive and helping to make it possible. I think policy is a huge piece of it. Um, you know, if you think of my example earlier when I said I think it has to be somewhat top down and bottom up, I don't think policy alone can do it. But we have some really great policy initiatives as examples. Um, in fact, we have a whole contingent here from our wonderful Foothill De Anza Community College District they were helped to spearhead uh, a bill in the state legislature last year um, that basically said that um, you know, open content, you know, open education resource needs to be a mandate of the community colleges. This is a lot about textbooks and the cost of textbooks and the, and the prohibitive cost of textbooks for community colleges. So that's just one example of, you know, of a very top-down policy initiative that could have a big impact. When we talked, just gave the example too about the Ministry of Education in South Africa. If they really mandate uh, open, you know, open education resources as their primary and secondary education, that's that's going to have a pretty far-reaching impact, not only in South Africa but through a lot of you know the African continent more generally. Um, there's some other initiatives like that. The state of Florida has recently done a lot of work with this, both in their K-12 and higher ed systems. Um, I'm trying to think of some other. So there's other examples that are starting to brew. Oh, Utah, um, Utah has also d um, passed, I think, some legislation around this as well. Washington State, okay. So we're starting to see this grow, and I think that, um, and, and those are meta policy level, right? There's also the policy level of what happens at a district and what happens at a school. Uh, I think those are also very important policy decisions as well. And the question, or you know, I mean, one of the elephants in the room has to do with the publishing industry, and what you know, what are the implications for that? And I think we've seen two things so far. We've seen a very skittish kind of anti-open content group, and we've seen some real innovators and progressive publishers who say this is certainly the wave of the future. How? What is our role in that? Much like we've seen um, open source software, I think, in the same way. Does anybody want to add anything to that question about policy? Yes. Uh, well, homeschoolers have been doing this for at least a decade, uh, finding free stuff online. I mean, you talk about developing free textbooks. We know where they are, and they've been using them for a long time. So it's kind of it's kind of fascinating to see that we education uh, is 
establishment is kind of catching up to what the homeschoolers are doing. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting, so the observation was about homeschoolers and how homeschoolers have been doing this for at least a decade. And I think that's an interesting point to make because um, homeschooling certainly isn't informal learning, but when we do think about the, all of the informal learners, the self-learners out there, that's a similar model to homeschooling in that way. What does it mean to really have a, you know, a learning culture where people can find these things on their own, whether they're in education systems, homeschooling, or you know, you're learning something because you want to. Yes, you have it? Uh, I wanted to point to a, another elephant in the room. Yes. Um, and very similar to the question of uh, what happens to publishers, to, to text publishers, in the wake of this movement. Their concerns and how they get on board, I would point to the same kind of consideration for teachers. I mean, I just, I mean, conceptually, I think that that has to be the way that we approach that. And not only for the 10-year-old, but for the adult who needs to kind of get back to that inquisitiveness of the 10-year-old, right? We, I mean, there's many people who would benefit from that. Maybe it's not as flashy with the colors that appeal to kids today, but I think that's a good point. Specifically, I think you asked about, you know, why, why not have OER Commons really focus in that area? It's something that we've definitely looked at. There are some good um, sites that people are trying to do that with kids now. And again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We do want to integrate the wheel. We want to, we want to, you know, kind of weave this web a little more tightly of people who are already doing these types of things. But I think that's definitely uh, a missing piece at this point. We know that a lot of that type of collaboration takes place. We know that kids, there's some amazing sites. Um, what's it called? Taking It Global, it's a, a site in Canada that's doing some really interesting work about getting kids involved in social activism. So it's all about curriculum materials, but it's all about, uh, it's all about basic civic, civics and, and social engagement. Um, does anybody else have an example of kid things that are, which is Mike's, M I K E S I T E. Okay, Mike's, Mike's it's, a, site? it's a fellow in Estonia, a country where nobody speaks the language. And he has started up something uh, almost a decade ago now. And I met him when he was out here. <laughs> and he um, is, he has a young Estonian kids develop a, a, like a little unit study, like say on the farm. And then he has, and it's illegitimate in Estonian. And then he has high schoolers who are studying English translate the smaller children's stuff into just drop English. And then he sends it off to American or British speaking community groups to, to correct English. <laughs> and then once, in, once it's in correct English, then it's sent out to say uh, high schoolers in, in Italy to translate it into Italian or French and what have you. And then it goes back down to the smaller children to, in those countries to, to view. So that's the model, right? That is absolutely the model. We actually have an, an expert in the audience. I said I would point out people and embarrass them if I needed to. Tamu, you might want to just sort of raise your hand back there. He is the head of the Helsinki, Helsinki Media Lab, has been very involved in the creation of authoring tools for um, primary education um, There's a, uh, in Finland and Estonia. In fact, Estonia is one of the countries, not surprising that you said this, is one of the countries that we are, in fact, partnering with on teacher collaboration. Um, but Timu, did you want to add anything? Do you know this group? In,
I think that's, uh, I, again, I agree with you. I think um, that's a disturbing trend that we've seen. Uh, I also think that we're seeing some sort of hopeful kind of uh, eating away at the uh, edges of that now. Um, maybe after November, we'll even have bigger eating away of the edges. But, um, you know, it's interesting because with, within that, there are still a lot of ways that uh, teachers who have been doing this kind of work for a long time are, are still using th those kinds of processes and resources to try to supplement that in some way. Like for example, I w there's a, some products that the state of California insists that teachers use. We won't get into that because that's very political. But the point is that teachers are in fact creating um, s and supplementing some of these products now with their own questions and they're, they're, they're basically doing this whole collaborative kind of open content area but in a little kind of in a, a little bit of a secret way, <laughs> right? You're not supposed to mess with these materials. These are all cop you know, all rights reserved materials. But I think tapping into what some of that that's going on is, is what we're trying to do because we are seeing that that's a positive impact and teachers have been doing that for years. And yes, some of them are sort of getting discouraged, but some of them are still doing that work. Could you speak up? Uh, I was wondering if there's some fact basis and then establish that if you use these kinds of social means, the outcomes are better. <laughs> there is some good research. The question is, uh, people who are using these techniques, what do we know about the research? Are there researchers here who've studied collaborative learning? And okay, so they can certainly speak to this. I think we have some great examples uh, that I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I think the answer is also that things can be done well and things cannot be done well, right? You know, and I think there's everything in between. But I think that we've really seen, uh, particularly around teaching, you know, when that synergy is made between teachers, the work, it does add value to it. I mean, I think there is that, I think, it, I think the research really does show at this point that when you take something and, and, and add something to it, you add value whether it's because you've improved it or enhanced it or corrected a mistake in it, it that it actually that it has changed. But yes, what you could probably respond.
which is a, just a, so this example, Amy Brockman, who's done a lot of research. Well, that's exactly the point that I was going to make was that, absolutely, I mean, so that's an exciting thing when I hear that these th there's a dissonance between these two things because that's actually showing that there is a transformation of education that's needed, right? And so this work, I think if done in this way, actually starts to bring those things to a head in a more, in a more widespread way than when we just have a little bit here and a little bit here. I think as these issues come up more, as people start using wikis, uh, I was just at <coughs> this talk uh, last week where there was a professor of, he was at, from Cambridge and he taught 12th century literature and his grad students, you know, they had scanned these manuscripts and they were all arguing about the translations and, you know, the finer points, that's what you do when you're a grad student in 12th century literature. And it was very exciting, this was all wiki based, but what, what, what he was saying is oh, they're taking your best ideas, they're not going to get published now. There, right, you know, he was all concerned that in fact they were, so this is just another example of how it's kind of pushing up against sort of the norm of traditional education and thinking. I mean, that's a K-12 example about grades, but here's an example about, you know, rewards and recognition. He was very concerned that these grad students not put themselves out in this way because they were ruining their chances of being published. Exactly. <coughs> So this to me is the most exciting work of open education resources because it's really pushing on these boundaries in that way. Yes? Well, to comment on the last point, we're the whole Web 2.0 seminars here, we're looking at what is collaborative value versus individual value. And that really speaks to a whole different way of looking at economies. Do you have a comment to that? doesn't do relative to the needs of, of you know the, the needs that we're talking about is educate. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a huge opportunity I think uh, in, the, in the in the open source world uh, to uh, enter that sector and make some differences. So the issue is about uh, gaming and the open source sector and education. For those of you who couldn't hear the question, um, it's interesting. You know, there's a there's an initiative called the Serious Games Initiative, which is really thinking about these games in this education you know, arena and what that really means to be talking about learning. You know, I, I again, I'm, I agree with that, with you wholeheartedly. What we've seen though, and I know because we've worked with groups who are trying to do these education games, is at this point still, the money to produce those kinds of things. Um, and I don't, I'm not talking about the multi-million dollar one or you know, multi-hundred million dollars with all the fanciest graphics, but you know, time and time again, when we've helped people, you know, directly write proposals to think about this, people come back and say, well, if you're not talking about this many million, we're simply not interested. Now, what I think is starting to change that is as we start to see some of these open source tools be able to be used for gaming. And that, that might be part, you know, in other words, it might be part of a technology issue. Uh, there's also a lot of evidence that you don't need big flashy games to actually have learning. You know, that excitement can be done in a lot more rudimentary way in terms of graphics and those kinds of things. Was this a gaming co comment that you want to make here? structure. 
Yeah, so there's, there's really a whole spectrum of this now. So the question is about, you know, does this technology that we're using have to be, in fact, open source software and the cost of maintaining that and keeping it up? But you've asked the second question, which is really about the content, you know, keeping up and correcting as well. So the spectrum is that there are, in fact, people who are in this open education content movement who believe that anything that you want to create for open content has to be in open source. And that's the only stuff they'll work with, and they won't support anything else, right? We're a little bit, at least we at ISCME are a little bit more realistic because we're actually working with teachers in schools, <laughs> you know, all around the world. And we're saying, what is that teacher using to create his or her content? You know, and if they're cre using Microsoft Word, we're going to help them use this in Microsoft Word, right? So we're trying to meet people where they are and move them forward. I think ideally the concept of open source is a great one and that we should move towards that. But I think that where we are today, it's not like we can just snap our fingers and say today from here on in, all of these things will be open source. In terms of the improvements over time, you know, I think we've, we have some really great examples from, you know, from Red Hat and what's happening with Linux and um, you know, Ubuntu, we, we've seen the examples where either for-profit companies will actually, exactly. So we'll see for-profit companies who start to maybe take some aspect of this, you know, service around open education and help that. And then we'll also see communities of people like Wikipedia. You know, there was that great article that compared the mistakes in Wikipedia around some, it was around some medical issue around um, with the New, New England Journal of Medicine. And it basically found about the same number of inaccuracies in those two pieces. But the difference was that Wikipedia, once they found them, they could change them easily, right? right? So I just think that's kind of the mentality that we have to think of in, in that way when we think about that. You know, we're just about out of time. So I just wanna just kind of sum up a little bit, and this is actually kind of, in some ways sums up some of the conversation that we've just had here. But this whole idea, I mean, so this is what we've learned so far, both from this whole OER Commons as well as from these initiatives worldwide that we've seen, that this whole, you know, this whole um, increased attention to interoperability to facilitate the exchange is gonna be probably one of the most important things that happens in the next couple of years. And, you know, think Facebook, right? How many people have accounts on Facebook? Some people are afraid to let us know. <laughs> you can find me there if you have an account. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting is not that it's this platform that kids can post everything about their social lives, but it's what's really fascinating is the way people are learning, the way people are sharing. You know, what would it, we've actually have a little application on Facebook we developed called OER Daily. So just like you can get your horoscope daily, you can get a resource daily that will, you know, be some cool open education resource. Well, wouldn't it be neat then if people could take that and share that? You pick your 10 favorites and then you share that with your friends. And what if you then also in that Facebook platform could add to that material and add a rating or a review? And then we wanna know about that over at OER Commons, right? That's just, an, and it's Facebook today, it's something else tomorrow, but the point is that interoperability of how people are moving throughout the web, I think we have to just sort of ride that wave with them. And that's, I think, the most important thing about platform and technology developments today. Um, the third point here about facilitating workshops and training opportunities, this is really a key piece too. It, we, we are talking about the transformation of teaching and learning, which means we are talking about cultural changes and shifts. So these aren't things that happen overnight. These are things that required a lot of concerted efforts and not because we do the best marketing campaign, it's because we actually help teachers and other educators really engage and, and see that there's a difference when they use these types of resources and when they engage in these types of collaborative processes. 
That's what's going to make a difference. When somebody sees there's, in fact, a value added from what they do. Um, and then lastly, again, I mentioned this before, but to really figure out how you embed these processes both into formal and informal learning environments. Because we're also seeing, you know, as an educator and somebody who has a degree in education, you know, this, I get asked this question all the time, you know, are we going to have schools in 20 years? Right? That's a whole other topic for a forum. But, you know, it really is interesting when you think about the role of school, the role of schooling, you know, what does that look like? How does something like an open education resource movement impact that? You know, if the kind of learning we can do is, is there, um, not because it's just a resource online, but because there's mentors and there's like-minded people who you find that are struggling with that same algebra problem in three parts of the world at that one moment in time, right? I mean, all of these things, they start to really, really shift, I think, the way we think about education and learning. Um, lastly, this is just something exciting that I'm involved in, and there's a good quote I'm going to show you in a moment. But the Cape Town Declaration was something that was um, similar to like the Budapest Declaration around open source. This was an attempt to have a worldwide, you know, statement that said open education is good, it's okay, and here's why. I encourage you to look at it, capetowndeclaration.org. It's not the end all be all, but it's the first one of the first efforts that attempted to do this on an international level. The best news is it's got, people love it, people hate it, people are rewriting it, you know, it's, it's really into this whole um, kind of web 2.0 social networking environment. And I think this one statement in here is just really important and I wanted to leave you with it, um, that educators worldwide are developing a vast pool of resources on the internet, open and free for all to use. These educators are creating a world where each and every person on earth can access and contribute to the sum of all human knowledge. And that really is the point. Thank you.